Und wir kommen jetzt zur dritten Präsentation in dieser Sektion. And we now come to the third presentation in this section. Es geht ja auch um flüssigen It's also Wasserstoff. About liquid hydrogen. Wird halten, der Herr Dr. The presentation Thomas is given by Thomas Stepper. Er studierte Chemie Thomas Stepper studied hier in chemistry Wien, here in Vienna at the Universität. University of Technology. Und ist seit 2,5 Jahren bei der SAG And for 2.5 years he has been employed by SAG. And he has been heading the cryogenics team since 2022. Dazu muss ich noch anmerken, vor I also have Jahren, to add, 10 years ago, mal in einem Berg, I went to see a plant somewhere in Salzburg, diese Tanks entwickelt wurden, where those tanks were Phase. developed, in, that was das still in an early phase, so I'm really curious to see what has happened in the last Bitte. 10 years. Thank you very much for the kind words of introduction. I'm very happy to be able to be here today. It's my first presentation at the MOTA Symposium, even if I studied in Vienna. In my presentation, I would like to give to share some more general information, as the title um, shows you. At SAG, we have thought about the comparison between different alternative fuels, and in this case, mainly liquefied gases. And we wanted to compare them with conventional fuels, such as diesel or petrol. Um, and as a staff member of SAG, they um, do storage um, systems. So what interests us is the storage requirements uh, yeah, and the um, properties of the storage devices. Um uh, einen Bogen zu spannen zu meinem, zu meinem to maybe tie to in with what the, the previous, what the previous the presentations um, shared, I've brought you a picture here on the right. It's a Daimler Gen H2 truck, heavy-duty fuel cell-operated truck currently being tested on the road. And it is equipped with one of our prototype tanks. It's an LH2 tank by SAG. As my boss has already reported comprehensively in, during the last two years here, so this year I'm going to focus on the comparison with other alternative fuels. I'll start with a short overview of various um, types of fuels and also talk about energy efficiency, which is an important topic. Usually it's the first thing that people want to know when talking about alternative fuels. And then I'm going to talk about the storage systems proper, mainly talking about energy density and the cost that arises when using okay, those systems. Uh, Let's start here on the right-hand uh, side. Here are a number of alternative um, energy um, carriers uh, ordered by density, side, and it correlates nicely to the diagram on the left, fahrzeuges. where you have um, the weight of the uh, vehicle, and um, horizontally, then the range, the necessary range. So you can see that passenger cars, passenger car applications when it comes to the range, are quite comfortable also with a lower volumetric energy density as in the case of the Li-ion battery. But when we then go on to heavier vehicles that uh, have less downtime, when we talk about um, heavy-duty commercial vehicles or rail and um, ship transport would be even more extreme, then we see that we have that we need higher volumetric energy densities. So if we look back to the right-hand side, you can see that 
The next step would be gaseous hydrogen at 350 bar, so increasing energy density both for liquid hydrogen and for ammonia, and even higher for um, hydrocarbon-based um, fuels. And the four that I have put in the box here is what I would like to focus on today. First of all, energy efficiency considerations. So we've done, we've done a stepwise evaluation um, because we wanted to know what fuels are the most efficient ones. Well, this is just a, actually a rough estimate. I'm sure that other people have looked into this in much greater detail, but I, I think we still have a good picture of where the challenges are and where the problems are. So first of all, we looked at fuel production. We limited ourselves to CO2 neutral pathways because we assumed that those fuels would be produced with renewable electric energy. A second factor for calculation was the fact that those fuels are probably not produced on site, but they have to be shipped, transported. So we have assumed a shipping distance of 5,000 kilometers and then further on distribution by truck over 500 kilometers on the road. And we also looked at the efficiency of the drivetrain in order to arrive at um, overall efficiency. Something that we have not considered is the the efficiency of electricity generation. We would have to use that as a factor for all fuels. So I think that it doesn't really matter for our comparison because we do want to look at only this one scenario. Now the production steps. Important information. We limited ourselves to production by means of electrical energy, renewable electricity, meaning mainly hydrogen production, production by means of water electrolysis. You can see that this is the first um, module for the production of all of these fuels. For liquid hydrogen, the step left is then liquefaction. And for the carbon um, fuels like methanol and synthetic and natural gas, we also have to provide carbon. So we use the direct air capture or use it for our calculation. And for ammonia, you also need a second synthetic synthesis gas that would be nitrogen. So it's more nitrogen than CO2. This is why this production step is clearly more efficient, but it does have to be taken into account. And then the various um, steps in the case of LNG, liquid natural gas, you will also have to look at the liquefaction step. Diesel has been used as the benchmark for the comparison. So we looked at crude oil extraction and then the refining process. Uh, we did those um, um, charts for all fuels. Uh, it's better to read them from the right to the left. So we start with the necessary energy that the vehicle needs in order to have a certain range. Then you multiply the efficiencies and you end up for liquid hydrogen with an overall efficiency of about 24%. And we did this for all of those fuels. We also, if relevant, also um, divided the drivetrain between fuel cell and the other. So this is the diagram that we got. We will start with the green bars at the bottom, that's usable energy and thus also if total efficiency. So if you compare on the basis of these figures, you see that ammonia and liquid hydrogen 
used via fuel cells have the sh show the highest efficiency. But you also see that um, if you look at the efficiency of diesel here in this um, overall picture, um, is still higher than all the rest. That's just because of the production steps. About 40 to 50 percent of total energy for those alternative fuel go into the production, and that is the big difference to diesel, where you don't have any chemical conversion processes, no electrolysis. So total efficiency is higher for diesel. You also see the transport and distribution um, are more or less negligible. Also, if the distances are higher, the only exception being maybe liquid hydrogen. In our calculation, we assumed that when it comes to shipping, transport by ship, the currently available solutions um, probably will involve larger boil-off losses over the duration of transport. And a note, you see the very different bars in the use of ammonia between fuel cell and ice. We are not engine. Um, uh, we don't build engines, so it was uh, very difficult for us to find values and efficiencies for an ammonia-driven, ammonia-fueled ICE. And for fuel cell, we assumed it would be a hydrogen fuel cell. So the ammonia, it's what is not ammonia to power, but it is a cracking process that is in between. How efficient that is in the stationary state can be assessed, but to do that mobile on the truck is not really state of the art. This is why the two efficiencies for the drivetrain with ammonia um, should be seen as sort of ballpark figures. Now the storage systems. We decided to use cryogenic storage and dis distinguish that from conventional storage. The most important differences has, have been very nicely described by the previous speaker. Actually, there are just two big differences that come in here. In cryogenic storage, a liquefied gas has to be kept liquid which requires insulation from the environment. And as the data show you, that's quite simple for ammonia because the boiling point at one bar is not really very much below the ambient temperature. But for liquid natural gas or liquid hydrogen, it's, uh, it requires vacuum insulation and, and so on. And we have a um, pressure vessel. So the liquefied gases have to be stored in a pressure vessel. And those are the two big differences between those and the methanol or diesel tank, because that increases complexity and thereby also costs quite considerably. Now, just some comments on volumetric and gravimetric energy density for the fuel and for the storage system. This we've seen before that it's not the entire mass of fuel that can be used, particularly when it comes to cryogenic storage. So th this has been taken into account for that graph. We have an expansion volume. We have um, remaining mass that cannot be used. This is why the values for the value for the fuels are a little lower than you would find them in conventional tables for the pure fuels. And in the storage system, we need to take into account weight and the loss of volume that you have because of the storage system. And the, when we start with volumetric energy density, you see that diesel, both in terms of the fuel and the storage system, 
is clearly better than alternative fuels. That is also true of gravimetric energy density, although LNG and liquid hydrogen have a higher gravimetric energy density than pure fuel. But if you consider the rather heavy overall system with stainless steel, then we go clearly below the value of regular aluminium diesel tanks. So then you have this sequence with both volumetric and gravimetric energy density. You see that liquid hydrogen has the lowest energy density, then ammonia, methanol, and LNG have similar values, and diesel from today's point of view seems unreachable. So what's the impact then on a storage system for a heavy-duty truck that um, needs to have a 1,000-kilometer range? On the graph here, you have the overall storage system mass. For the conventional storage of methanol or diesel, the mass of the storage system is hardly relevant. You have higher masses of fuel there, the, and the fuel that is shown here is enough for, one, to, for a 1,000 kilometer range. We need very little hydrogen gravimetrically in order to reach 1,000 kilometers, but you also see that you um, here, the problem is a relatively high weight. As far as the gravimetric index is concerned and the gravimetric energy density, a good choice of material can give you some improvements. If you um, can use aluminium tanks, you can save about up to half of the, of the mass. And of course, the pressure that is needed in the pressurized tank is important. If you have a reduced wall strength, you can also clearly reduce the weight. In terms of volume, it's different. The volume of the storage system is more determined by the density of the fuel and the physical limits can only be expanded by changing the pressure. So there is less leeway um, for the volume than with the weight of the system. What about the cost of comparable storage systems? Here on the graph you see the cost standardized to uh, liquid natural gas storage and the percentage figures should, it's again for 1,000 km, kilometers range and you see that a conventional tank with um, liquid fuel, no matter whether it's e-fuels or diesel or petrol, is more expensive by a, to a one or two orders of magnitude. No, I'm sorry, says the speaker, um, the other way around, the cryogenic storage is um, much more expensive than diesel storage systems. For liquid hydrogen, the very high bar, because at least on European trucks, you can only have one cubic meter of storage space. So you need two tanks for to, in order to reach 1,000 kilometers. Since you need two tanks, we have higher costs. If that were shown with just one tank, you would find that it's about 10 percent um, more higher cost than an LNG tank. Again, the ammonia tank has a relatively big range in our calculation because the requirements placed on the storage systems are not yet fully known. And supply pressure, what do we have to provide 
plays a decisive role here. This is why the, the range is quite big here. Probably ammonia is going to be clearly less expensive than a full cryogenic storage. But it's, since it still needs to be a pressurized tank, it will never be as cheap as diesel or e-fuel tanks. Okay, that takes me to my summary. Our efficiency analysis favors, first of all, the use of liquid hydrogen or ammonia as a fuel when compared to other alternatives like synthetic LNG or methanol and derivatives thereof or other e-fuels. However, it has to be said that an energy efficiency is just one side of the coin. We've seen that we have major energy losses when we want to produce fuels with um, renewable energy because we have to use chemical processes. Energy has to be invested in the production. And the most important point is that we need to have um, sec secure sources of renewable energy. What fuel will then be used will not be decided on the basis of, en of efficiency, in our opinion. Same time, transport and storage of cryogenic fuels, so LNG, or liquid hydrogen in that case um, is relatively time and cost intensive and you have higher investment cost, both in terms of in infrastructure and storage systems. And that, of course, then somehow needs to, you need to find a break-even point through um, um, operating cost. So although the LNG tank is much more expensive than a diesel tank, there is still many trucks on our roads that use LNG fuels. As far as energy density is concerned, in brief, liquid hydrogen and ammonia, as compared to carbon-based alternative fuels, has a lower energy density, but still significantly higher than currently available battery technology. Battery technology can simply not reach those values right now. In, for, in terms of mass, there is some optimization potential, maybe through design changes. In terms of volume, well, there it's the physical properties that limit us. When it comes to liquefied gases, where you have um, lower pressure, you cannot randomly increase volumetric energy density. And the costs will simply rise significantly with the complexity of the system. And to tie in again with the previous speaker, you, we need vacuum insulation. We need valves for the uh, cryogenic part. We have a pressurized vessel. Those are things that are simply more expensive than a simple aluminum tank for a liquid fuel. So this takes me to the end of my presentation. Unfortunately, I cannot really say now where we are going to end up, but we at SAG can produce relatively simple storage uh, tanks like the diesel tanks up there, but also the uh, more complex tanks for the cryogenic fuels. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Stepan, for your presentation. Um, we don't really know where we end up, but we will probably end up at a place where the system just simply is most beneficial for the customer. You start talking about efficiencies. And... Um, Shouldn't you also have looked at E-diesel if you compare with renewable fuels? Because 
Comparing something with fossil diesel is a bit difficult, also when it comes to efficiencies. Well, yeah, our originally the objective was to compare the requirements for the storage system. We choose methanol as the, let's say, simplest product. But of, that can then be converted to all sorts of sin fuels. But you're right. The further steps, I haven't shown it, but the refining process of the, of the crude oil does need energy, but not as much energy as to make it um, incompetitive. And we have seen in the energy efficiency values that 25% was the best value, down to 15, 16% for synthetic natural gas, which is probably the least favorable fuel of choice if you do it with electrolysis. And that also includes various longer chain e-fuels. And the longer chain e-fuels will probably fall even below 18% if I look at the processes that are needed. But as you've said, technical efficiency is not the decisive factor. It's the total, the overall efficiency. Yes, that's our impression. So the floor is open for question. Professor Hofbauer. Professor Hofbauer. As an engine builder, when I see that, it makes me cry a little um, because we see how um, so much better diesel engines are in terms of efficiency. But your considerations for hydrogen generation, you did it only with electrolysis, but you could also use natural gas. If you take the chemical reactions and take hydrogen from natural gas, which is there sort of in unlimited amounts, you need 7.5 times more energy for electrolysis than when you get the hydrogen from natural gas. And if you would take this into account in your calculations, it would be interested where hydrogen would end up then. Of course, uh, by um, leaving out all the other efficiencies during other production sex, but a factor of 7.5, is that is something you have to um, achieve. Well, in, when talking about electrolysis, we assume very high efficiency, also high temperature electrolysis, which again is not as well suited for um, renewable energy because um, you have other losses there, but you're right. If you used natural gas, but then of course the, uh, the use of LNG is, would also be more exciting because if you take natural gas that is produced by electrolysis, it's not economical. Yes, of course, the efficiency will then rise for the liquefaction. We took a state-of-the-art efficiency of 70 percent. Thermodynamically, you need about 10 percent of the energy content of the hydrogen. You can only hope that by scaling effects, um, this value will go up. We have to assume that hydrogen as the first um, part of the chain will be the most efficient fuel because all the other fuels that build on it will need further conversion steps. 
If I may add something today, hydrogen is almost exclusively generated from um, LNG, but it's not renewable. And this compared renewable fuels. And this is why you should have looked at renewable diesel. Natural gas, yes, we're using it, but you could uh, also compare carbon capture and storage and all of that. But if I look at uh, renewables only, the natural gas comes from fossil sources. I'm sorry, the speakers of mic and can't be heard. Well, this is a, a different focus, Professor Hofbauer. It's not about what is available, because then you would say the electricity that we have looked at is not even available right now. It's about comparing systems that are CO2 neutral. Well, I mean, actually, nothing is really neutral, but low CO2 systems. So you need um, source material that is CO2 free, renewable electricity, and then you produce a product. Again, the professor is off mic. Sorry, the professor cannot be heard by the interpreters. Well, I spent 25 years in the oil and gas industry, and I can tell you there are many resources. It's always a question of cost. When the oil price is high, you will invest, um, you will pay more for extraction. But gas is fossil, natural gas taken from the ground that um, evolved millions of years ago is a fossil fuel. And here, only renewable fuels work. Compared. Well, I, I think I put it somewhere. 95% of hydrogen are generated from natural gas, only 5% from electrolysis. And again, that is the critical thing. Using, you have to invest a lot of energy in the electrolysis step. And I don't think it's going to work without the classical generation on the basis of natural gas. But again, we wanted to just compare production through natural, through renewable, renew, with new, Sorry, on the basis of renewable energy. Again, the professor is unfortunately off mic and can't be heard by the interpreters. Yes, right. That's why I said if you take fossil natural gas, you have to do something with the carbon. Yes, you can. That's right as a matter of principle, says the chairman. Again, sorry. Well, if carbon capture and storage are um, allowed by the law, then it's okay. But essentially, I can only store it because the use cases for are hardly here, because in Austria, you buy CO2 from Agrana, it's an ethanol plant, although chemically it's the same CO2 as the refinery in Schwechat produces it, thousands of tons of very pure CO2, but storage is not allowed in Austria right now. The OMV is also in offshore storage projects, but that's comparing apples with pears. This was about comparing renewable paths with the current convention pass with diesel. But of course, there's an, any number of perspectives that you can take. Well, this has not been looked at here, says the chairman, but we know these processes as well. Very sorry, the professor cannot be heard since he does not speak into a microphone. 
Well, says the chairman, in order to conclude that, may the best win. Thank you very much for the presentation.